Good morning, everyone. I welcome you to the Filmmakers Forum of the School of Media and, and Communication organized by the Nollywood Studies Center. Let me welcome particularly our guest, Steve Gokas. Welcome, Steve. Good to have you. Thank you for having me. Thank you for coming. Well, we we will start, even though our guests are a little behind in joining us, but we'll start and then people will log in as, okay, now people are coming in a bit more now. Well, once again, welcome to the Filmmakers Forum. The Filmmakers Forum, like I said, is an initiative of the School of Media and Communication organized through its Nollywood Study Center. And the whole idea of the Filmmakers Forum is to facilitate uh, an interaction amongst filmmakers and also to create that link between the filmmakers and the members of the audience. And so we hope, as usual, that this will be an engaging session. We are honored to have with us Steve Gukas. As we go along, we will take your questions. So please feel free to post them in the chat box and we'll take them from there. But let me introduce our guest. He doesn't need much of an introduction. He's very well known in the industry. Steve Gokas is a seasoned filmmaker with a background spanning television, theater, advertising, and film. He earned a diploma in television production from the NTA Television College in Joss. This was followed by a Bachelor of Arts degree in theater arts from the University of Joss. He subsequently studied film production at the London Film School. Among his notable accomplishments is the film A Place in the Stars, a tribute to the late Professor Dora Kungili, which received the Best Movie Drama Award at the Africa Magic Viewers Choice Awards in 2015. Steve has also produced impactful films like Namibia, The Struggle for Liberation, which premiered at the 2006 Pan-Africa Film Festival in Los Angeles and garnered numerous awards. His extensive filmography includes significant works such as Keeping Faith, Katanga, Three Scores and Ten, Alive to View, Soweto, Mr. Johnson, and 93 Days. In addition to his film ventures, he has also produced and directed several commercials and documentaries. In December 2020s, Steve's company, Natives Filmworks, initiated the first features project in partnership with Michelangelo Production. The project is dedicated to nurturing 12 first-time directors and guiding them in the production of their debut feature films. The project has yielded five films to date, with the latest release, Love and Life, premiering on Amazon Prime on December 29, 2023. Steve Gokas continues to make an impact on the Nigerian film industry, showcasing his commitment to fostering new talent and delivering compelling stories. So once again, Steve, you are most welcome and thank you for being with us. Let's well, yeah. set the ball. Sorry. Yeah. Let's uh, set the ball rolling by okay, creating a bit of a framework. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself and why you decided to go into filmmaking? Okay, um, so um, my my first encounter um, with with film um, was um, watching in school um, tit for tat, um, the good, the bad, and the ugly, um, and and so in terms of watching actual film projected. Um, Prior to that, of course, you're watching TV and, and you're seeing stuff like um, like Hammer House of Horror, mm -hmm. um, The Bridge Over River Kwai, and, and those type of, of, of films were what I was first exposed to. And of course, then there is drama um, whilst you're in school. And, and for me, it, I was always curious about who are the people who put this thing together? So I was never, you know, one that wanted to be in front of the camera, the one to be seen. I, I was always curious about the hands behind the scenes that made that happen. 
And, and as I, you know, read more and learned more about it, I, I, I knew clearly that what I wanted to do was a behind the scenes person and that I'd like to be um, a director. Um, so that's my pull um, to, to, to filmmaking. And that led to, um, I think first and foremost, it was a, uh, an attempt to get into a space where you could learn that. So I, I, I got admission into university of my degree to go and study um, um, uh, mass communication because at the time that was the closest you could get yes. uh, to, to filmmaking if you weren't going abroad. Um, but whilst I was waiting to go to my degree, um, I also got word that um, NTA college, TV college at the time, which was purely a training school for um, NTA staff and other TV station staff had decided that they were going to open and, and they were now going to take private candidates. And, and so I, I, I applied and, and um, um, you know, got accepted to, to read for a diploma in, 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 in film production at, at, at um, NTA TV College. That broadened my scope and understanding of, you know, of, of what that sort of work was all about. And further fueled my determination to want to um, study this further. Um, that led to, you know, reading theatre arts, um, following that. And then, of course, subsequently um, reading um, film production at the London Film School. So that's my journey, you know, sort of into, into filmmaking. Now, it, it happens in, in our society that especially at the time which in which you went into this field that there is this negative perception there has been i think it has improved greatly today but at that time it was a bit more this negative perception about that whole sector in which they considered people going into the theater arts going into film as well layabouts and this kind of thing so did you face that challenge with your family when you said i'm going into filmmaking how was that a problem for you well i mean you can imagine the drama when someone that's gone in to do a degree program comes back home and says you know what i don't want to do the degree program i'm going to go and do a diploma program forget about what the sub course was just that you were giving up a degree right. program for a diploma program you can imagine the furore that that's you know uh generated uh then you come down to the fact that oh okay you were leaving um that to come and study um and film production okay so what are you even going to do when you finish you know um but i i suppose that's the that's the power of 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 um of single-mindedness when you are focused on something and 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 you've you've sort of convinced yourself of the importance of this for your life and 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 and, and what you really want to do that would make you happy um, so that was um, a situation where a lot of people did not understand why that decision was taken. Um, but sometimes you have to be very um, dogged and, 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 and persistent about what you want to do. And, and when people see that that's what you want to do and you're totally sold on doing it, they, they come around eventually. Have you faced, I mean, well, no, let, let me phrase that differently. Between when you started and now, would you say that there has been a change in this area in terms of perception, societal perception? Because I think now we see that, yes, it's, it's a viable field. It's easier to see today than it was back then. And people see that, well, people going into that sector are very serious people indeed. Do you have a different feel of it today as well, back then? Well, I, I think that I think that both um, both in terms of stature and, and, and that's more to do with the, the possibilities in terms of, of earnings. Um, there's been a huge improvement, um, you know, from when we started out and where the industry is today. Um, Today we get calls. I mean, I get calls from parents saying, oh, my son wants to do this or my daughter wants to do this. Could you help them, you know, um, you know, give them a leg up, you know, um, because 
you can now see clearly there's this this clarity on on what is what what it is that this, this whole thing is about uh when we first started your your outlet was was mostly just television so whatever you were doing was going to go on tv um and and if it wasn't going to go on tv then it really didn't have anywhere else to go um since then um you've had you've had you've had cable now you had cinema and layered on top of that now you have the streamers uh, and and increasingly even from a commercial standpoint conversations about okay so if 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 you make this how are you going to make the money back and how are you going to make a living from it you can answer those questions now um, and i don't think that 10 years ago you could answer that question very clearly um so not even going way 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 back just just that 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 that, that far back and you see that the the change is very um clear and I think that in terms of the fact that because there are more avenues where people can see your work, um, the, the, the sense of you're doing something important, you're providing entertainment, you're, 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 you're pricking the conscience of society, you're holding a mirror up, you know, for us to see who we are and, and, and what we are, where we're at and where we need to be, uh, ascribe a sort of stature to, 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 to people working in the industry that wasn't there before. Let me take you up on something you've just said, that mm. the filmmaker is holding up a mirror to society and pricking consciences. Mm. You are quoted as saying, when you have a voice, you have a platform, you have a responsibility. This is something of yours that was quoted in an interview. And you said this in regard to the role that firms should play in addressing issues and fostering the right conversation. So what is your philosophy on the role of firm, especially with regards to advocacy? Well, I, I think that film, just like any art form, um, I, I, I take from two people here. So, so there's this, this fella um, who mm -hmm. said that, um, you know, you can't just do music for music's sake. Because, you know, in the climes where we operate, there's just too much, you know, to, to talk about, you know, so you can't just do music for music's sake. Your, your music should say something. Your music should generate something. Uh, and then I think it was Pablo Picasso who said that art, you know, must generate questions that, you know, that people right. then try to seek answers to. It can't just be art for art's sake. Each art must generate some sort of question, must ask questions uh, of, of the person looking at it or admiring it or viewing it or whatever it is. Now, I put those two together, you know, to say that actually, you know, when you, when you make a film uh, or when you, when, you, when you have a platform from which people listen to what you say, uh, people consume what you say, uh, in our climb, that comes with a responsibility that each piece of work you put out, you know, must ask a question of society, must hold up a reflection of society that generates some sort of conversation that makes people think, reflect, and, you know, leading to, um, you know, different kinds of conversation. Um, I would like that people come out of my films with questions and having, you know, conversations about what they've just seen, but not just that, but that what they've just seen also elicits conversation across other areas uh, that are, you know, um, um, necessary for conversations to be happening in. So whether it's, um, whether it's a, whether it's a rom-com or whether it's very, very deep, serious drama or black comedy, whatever it is, you know, you must seed it with questions that people who watch it and consume it would try to at least have a conversation about. Beyond conversations, in terms of action, perhaps, what would you expect? Because I'm sure you wanted to go merely beyond the conversations. Because in an essay of yours, which you strikingly titled, you are the reason we are a shithole country. You say, until you join me to say enough is enough and decide to do something about it, the result will continue to be the same. The Nigeria we all dream of will remain a mirage. So on that basis, I imagine that certainly you want people to take those conversations somewhere. So what if I were to ask what concrete thing 
would you really like to see beyond so, the conversations? So when I when I say conversation, I, I believe that each action is first seeded in a conversation. Now, right. whether it's a conversation you have with others or is a conversation you have with yourself, but every human action is preceded with a story that you tell yourself to justify that action. So in the conversations that you have seeded or drawn from uh, whatever art you consume, begin the formation of stories that you tell yourself that then make you look at how you act differently or view that a second time and maybe say, you know, based on A, B, C, D, I, I ought to be doing that. Because the, the thing is, you, you, can't, you, can't, you can't physically, you know, make someone do something, but you can on a very, um, very sublime, very um, easy, gentle manner, seed thoughts, seed conversations, because that thought leads to self-conversation or that thought leads to conversation with others. And that conversation with others leads to some kind of action. And films have been known to lead to a lot of action and change. But, but, yes. but that, that happens with films that are not didactic. Mm -hmm. You know, the films have to understand, or the filmmakers have to understand the art of seeding conversations and seeding questions in the stories that you tell. Uh, because it is, when it's when it's consumed without a feeling of being lectured or being talked right. to that right. it is most likely to 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 seed and ask the right kind of questions elicit the right kind of conversations and lead to the actions that are needed i i i believe that that's 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 what it's like you know uh recently i have paid a bit more attention you could say to the words of our national anthem and really you listen you, you you pay attention to those lyrics it's a sort of uprising invigorating kind of thing to it now mm. uh, what you say i mean it, it links up with me with what you're saying about story and seeding action mm. how does that because really we are we are the kinds of stories we choose to accept and to live but then how does that guide you in terms of deciding which stories to tell. There's so much talk today about telling the authentic African story, whatever that may be. That so, is, yeah. <laughs> so, but how, when you choose your stories, because you did not, when you were speaking earlier, limit yourself to a particular kind of story, because you said the rom-com, the horror and so on. So in choosing your own stories now, keep it in mind what your philosophy is, what guides you in deciding which kind of story to tell? So first, the 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 stories I tell, or the kind of stories that appeal to me, must first and foremost resonate with me as a person, right? Okay. That's one. And then the story must also um, provide an opportunity for me to be able to say something that I, I'm burning to say, uh, to ask questions that I'm burning to ask. It, it must present me, you know, with that kind of opportunity. Um, and, and, and no matter how, um, how, how, how silly it, it might seem, you know, sometimes this is, is, in, is, is in the laughter that you seed okay. thoughts you know, and sometimes it's 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 in the mundane, and sometimes it's in the utterly serious that you can do that yes. as well. Um, first, it must provide me with that opportunity, and and once it does, then it doesn't matter what genre it is, um, okay. uh, because the truth of the matter is that each each genre has its um, has its guidelines, right? And and that once you understand the rules of any genre you can apply them to telling a story within that genre that still achieves, you know, what you want to achieve. So I don't feel limited to any particular genre. 
um, I feel pulled to stories and then the stories dictate how they want to be told. Great. Uh, as, a, as a lecturer, I know how, how thrilling it is when after you finish a course, students come and say, well, this thing you said resonated. I have been able to change or do this in this way. Mm. Do you get, have you received feedback like that in line with what you are trying to do with your firms? Do you get that kind of feedback that yes, which reaffirms really what you're trying to do to say yes it's working um i do get all kinds of feedback um some directly related to, to the film and and what the film was trying to do and and that's that's always gratifying when you get that um yes. but i also get feedback from people who who because of the particular way you made the film or, or because of your particular body of work have been drawn to become filmmakers themselves okay. and and want to okay. be filmmakers because the thing is that in the in the in in the multitude of voices you have more opportunities to speak yes. and therefore as much as <laughs> it, it is gratifying to get someone come back to say well i watched your film and it did this for me and it made me do this or this 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 or it just pricked my whatever it is as much as that is gratifying it is also equally if not even more gratifying to hear someone say well i am coming to this art form because you have inspired me to join it because then suddenly you are able to say more vicariously you know right. and therefore in that multitude of voices you have the opportunity to even speak more say more generate more and cause for more to happen. So, so on those two counts, it's always exciting um, to get feedback. I guess it's rather like building a, a group of disciples, so taking on the message. <laughs> okay. You can only say now, so much by yourself, you know that. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Just a reminder to our audience, please drop your questions in the chat box and we'll take them from there. Let's going a bit of a different direction uh, now along with dotun olakunri you have begun a project called first features which is aimed at training emerging directors and guiding them through the business of filmmaking can you tell us a little bit about this and what you hope to achieve okay so in again still writing the theme of multiplying your voice right yeah. Um, I have provided training um, to young filmmakers um, across Africa and, and, and in some parts of the world as well. And, and what you get is, is a people who are hungry to learn, passionate to go out and do something. But particularly in our climb, are faced with the challenge of then being able to actually practice what they have learned. And, and, and this, this also becomes some sort of a near exploitative bent to training, where people have, have seen training as a means of making money and therefore provide all kinds of training and there are the, 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 the people who, who provide training because they want to improve industry and all of that. And so there's, there's a mixture of both of that, but the byproduct of all of that is a filmmaker or, or a young person who has learned the craft in some form, um, but unable to find expression for it because they can't find the funding or can't find the appropriate platform. And, and, and so for me, it's always been at the back of my mind that I would like to someday be able to provide training. Uh, but that also, so aside from the, even during those trainings, what you find is you, you, you find young people who come to talk to you about, or, you know, what they want to do, what directing. What, for me, I'm passionate about the power of the director and what the director brings to the table. And and in interacting with a lot of directors and even in watching the works of a lot of directors, you know, um, 
from our climb. I find that there's a dirt of understanding of actually what the hell the director does, yeah. you know. And we have a lot of people who basically are coverage directors. So you, you go you go on set and it's 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 a wide, it's a medium, it's a close up, and we're out. Basically, depending on you know what action you're covering. But there's very little thinking, and there's very little they're adding to that. And for those kind of directors, I I say you're not you're not needed. The DP or the camera operator can do that. So what is the director bringing to the table? And I find in conversations and in watching the works of a lot of people that there's no clear understanding of what the director does. And and so I I I, I just wanted to say, listen. In my limited knowledge, this is what directing is. How do I pass that on to a younger generation of filmmakers who can then come to the craft and be able to uplift the output of the industry on the basis of informed knowledge and practiced knowledge? So for me, it became necessary that what we need to do is not just provide didactic training, but provide both that and practical training and provide a platform for them to be able to make their first feature film. And that can then become their foothold into the industry. And, and hopefully they become a new set of voices that would elevate the industry. So that was the thinking. And, and, and so that birthed first features. And, and when first features started, it was supposed to unfold different to the way it has now. But based on the initial thinking, we had 12 um, directors uh, that were shortlisted, 12 uh, different stories were also shortlisted, director and writer paired, and a development process, you know, that took yeah. the best of one year uh, happened uh, in terms of the stories and, and the writing. The ones that was ready, uh, we had a two week boot camp, you know, where I literally pulled my contacts from the industry across the world. We had people from LA, people from New York, people from London, people from South Africa, and of course, people from Nigeria uh, that formed the faculty uh, that, that right. provided training. And these were not people, mm -hmm. um, these were industry people who were working in the fields yes. that they were teaching on a daily basis. So it's the colorist that, that has colored all of my films. Uh, it's the editor that has edited all of my films. It's the composer that has composed, you know, for all of my films. It's so I pulled all of those people in to provide understanding, you know, for um, the directors and the, the other we're working with so that they know what sort of conversation to have with these different people and to understand in greater detail, you know, what, what a, a really professional um, editor, colorist, uh, sound designer, composer, what they do and, and how you relate with them as a director towards the realization of your vision. So right. you're talking to um, you're talking to George Callis, who 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 scored um, a place in the stars, ninety three days, living in bondage, and also scores music for Disney. Um, so when you're having that conversation, you're having that conversation at the height of the industry, right? And George is providing you guidance to understand the questions that you ask, how to relate with the composer, what, how, to, how to spot your movie, to be able to say, I think music will work here, I don't think music will work here, and how do you determine what kind of music you want to hear at every point in time? That's a conversation Nollywood does not provide you with, right? And, and you have the same thing with, um, with the colorist, right? Who's coloring for, for Netflix, is coloring for, 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 for BBC, is coloring for all kinds of people. You're having that conversation with someone who does it on a daily basis. Same thing with the editor. Same thing with the with the with the audio post people. I'm pulling in a wealth of experience that you would not have exposure to in one go. And in most film schools, will not even have exposure to at all. You know. Yeah. So, Dr. who's my production partner, um, runs Michelangelo Production, and when I pitched that idea to him. You know, we decided that, you know what, it's something that's worth running with. And 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 so we, we did. And essentially putting our money, you know, 
on the table to provide that training. Um, we, had, we had writers and we had directors from all over the country. And every single one of them, um, all we said to you that you had to do was get yourself to Abuja. If you get yourself to Abuja, we provided you boarding, we provided you feeding, we provided you a per diem, and we provided you training. For two weeks, you finish, you leave, not a cobble, right? And then after that, I then work with the directors individually. We take your script and we break it down. So you, 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 do, you do a lookbook based on your script, right? You bring that lookbook, we have a conversation, and you take that back, do whatever corrections there are. Then you now go on location recce. When you finish that, you do your short listing. And we do your short listing and that becomes a conversation. That's, that's a 10 day session with me every day, nine to five or nine to whatever time we finish that day. But we're looking at why you are taking every single shot. Because part of what I say to them is, listen, not even Spielberg ends up with the movie that he envisioned when he shoots a film, right? And that the, the closer you are to the film that you envision is a factor of how prepared you are when you go on set. Because everything that can go wrong will go wrong. It is your ability to rein things back in the direction of your vision that allows you to get as close to the movie you wanted to make. Because truth is, if you don't, the whole crew will make a film for you. There will right. be a film made, but it won't be the film you wanted to make. So the closer you get to the film you want to make is a factor of how prepared you are going into making that film. And so what we do with those directors is to get them as prepared as they can be, you know, possibly. And you have them relieve the story in five different iterations. Because first is the lookbook, then is the short list, then is the storyboard. Then it's the conversations they have to have, you know, with the designer, with the costume uh, designer, the production designer, the DOP, you know, those conversations all as you have them crystallize your vision and provide you clearer understanding of what you want to do and how you want to achieve that. And that shows when they are on set and it shows in the films that they have made. That sounds beautiful. It, it, it highlights for me a point I think that, that others have raised, which is that much of the training that goes on in the industry produces very good craftsmen. But in terms of understanding the principles behind, for instance, the shots or why certain things are done, the training is not very strong on that. So what do you think that we need to put in place to be sure that much of this is covered? Because you're doing a fantastic job, but your reach is also limited. You're dealing with 12 persons mm. and the immense number of people who want to go into the sector, who are entering the sector. So what kinds of structures do you think educationally we need in terms of preparing people to grow this industry? So, um, I, I, I don't want it to be interpreted to say that I don't think there's much to the training that is being provided already. Oh, no, 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 not at all, Good. certainly. <laughs> what, I, what, I, what I'm at pains to express is the fact that the opportunity to practice, right. right, is what is not in existence. And so when it comes to, when it comes to, to what I think is needed, is that I think that there, there needs to be more opportunities uh, to support first time filmmakers to be able to make the films that they want to make. Uh, there should be more opportunities to support, you know, schools like yours, um, schools like um, the NFI, um, to be able to have the necessary funding to support even the, the, the ambitions and the scope 
of the short films that the students they train can make. Uh, yes. and, and, and I think that if, if something was done that made it possible for the students to be able to actually do their graduation films as feature films rather than short films, you know, okay. again, you know, that would, that, would, that would hasten their entry into the industry uh, and, 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 um, and prepare them more uh, to succeed. Um, I just think that when we provide training, we should provide opportunity um, so that yeah. then the reason why we provided training in the first instance is realized because ultimately all training is geared towards improving the quality of the industry. And, right. and the people who train cannot do that unless we provide them a platform that leads them to, to do what exactly it is that we're training them to do. So when people argue for, 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 for all kinds of structures, I support that, right? But I, I would support even more uh, the creation of, of platforms for exhibition as well. Because the okay. more films can be shown and they're not fighting for the limited theater space that we have, right? Uh, the more filmmakers can make film and the more films can recoup their investments, the more filmmakers can make films. So I, I would support the, 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 the people who advocate for uh, increasing the number of, of, of theaters that we have. Um, I, I would go further to say that we need to have at least one theater in every local government in the country, and that that theater needs to be, um, doesn't need to be a multiplex, doesn't need to be a, 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 a galleria, you know, uh, but it needs to be some kind of community theater that allows for more so so imagine what's happening with um a tribe called judah you know headed towards 1.5 billion right but imagine that that film because even at that yeah. amount of money that film is probably still not yet seen by 500,000 yeah. people in the cinema yeah. right mm -hmm. so imagine that that film had avenue in all local governments in the country right imagine how much we'll be talking about and then imagine how many more films then, you know, uh, Fuki Akindele will be able to make. And she can't do all of those by herself, so she would have to engage other filmmakers. So that's what I'm saying. So first, an opportunity to make the films, or even more importantly, an opportunity to exhibit the films. So uh, it boils down largely to the funding aspect, because yeah. if we want to create that structure, <laughs> yeah. it's funding. The funding yeah. It. And I think also we could say that it highlights the important role that the government can play, because we have seen, yes, the industry has grown without, likely without that support, but mm -hmm. there, comes a, uh, there comes a phase, because I know that with the, with the distribution framework that was introduced by the Nigerian Film and Video Sensors Board, some of the people who took on that challenge, I think the results were not so fantastic, largely because they did not have the kind of funding required to set up that structure nationwide, yeah. uh, and so on and so forth. So I suppose part of the challenge here would be how really to create a structure, well, perhaps more of a policy structure more than anything else. Uh, but do you see hints of that happening now? Because now we see that the government is trying to put in place certain things and so on. From your perspective as a filmmaker, do you have you seen signs that perhaps we're inching, no matter how slowly, towards that goal? Well, I'll say I've heard talk um, and yet to see action. Um, um, so, um, there, there's been talk particularly from this, um, current, um, administration, uh, talk about, you know, moving the, the whole, um, art industry into a multi-billion dollar industry. Uh, and I suppose that with that comes an, an, a, a, a clear understanding that there's got to be a lot of investment into the sector yeah. to be able to make that happen. Um, and so we, we wait to see. Uh, but then 
more exciting is the is the AfriExim, uh, the um, the African Development Bank, and the sort of funds that they have now put in place um, to support um, filmmaking and film infrastructure development. Um, so our ability to tap into that as a country and as businesses, right, is also something that you could say is a step in the right direction. Now, how you do that is still not very clear yet. Uh, so, would, you know, I'm waiting to see what they have to say uh, in terms of how, how that is accessed and, 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 and what you need to bring. Uh, I'm hoping that they're not coming with the same, you know, collateral conversations yeah. that, um, that has hindered, you know, whatever intents the government has had in Nigeria. Uh, yeah, when they've made funds available, but no one's able to access the funds because of that requirement. Uh, I think we need to get to a point where um, IP itself can be considered collateral and that we can move uh, to put structures in place that ensure that the IP that will be created is worth the, the value that is placed on it. Because part of what happens sometimes is that you say, well, IP is collateral, but then, you know, um, excuse my friend, shit IP is created, you know, because the focus of the person creating the IP wasn't really creating value, embedding value in the IP, you know, it's other things. So the lending bodies have to be able to put structure in place that ensures that the, the quality of the, of the work that is created imbues value in the IP to the extent that it can be used to redeem the loan, you know, that you're given. So there's, there's that. Um, but I, I think that in terms of physical infrastructure, uh, I don't see a company that has either the funding or the appetite, you know, to, to yeah. roll out in the scale that is required. And that scale can only be achieved through some sort of government scheme, some sort of government um, intervention or support or whatever. But that's required. Um, and I think that I, I'm hoping that the right people are in the rooms where those conversations are happening and, and that government is steered in the direction that benefits the larger industry, not a few practitioners. Yes. Uh, uh, well, I, I would say that right now, more than just concrete bits of action, because that's what we've had, it, it's some intervention here, some intervention in there, perhaps what we need now is the development of a complete policy, which takes into consideration so many things and guides mm -hmm. so many things, because there's so many different levels that need to be addressed. Yeah. Well, let me take a question from Kem Dilim. And she says, congratulations, Steve, on all your achievements and success stories. I was wondering how the recent announcement from Amazon Prime on their intention to leave the African continent would affect Love and Life, which recently premiered on their platform. Why do you think the platform is not as popular in Nigeria as it is in the UK and elsewhere? Hmm. Okay, so I, I can speak to one half of that. I, I'm not sure that I'm going to speak to the other half of that. Um, um, which I, I would rather not look at how it affects love and life because I think love and life uh, is already on the platform. So right. whatever whatever it does, it would do. Um, my my thinking would be more towards how does that impact our industry. And 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 um, what does our industry need to do um, so that it is not um, its development? It's not so dependent on right. um, on what other people do and yes. and people who can come yes. and go. Uh, what can the industry yes. do for itself that ensures it is never exactly. in that position again? I think that's the conversation that needs to be had. Um, you know, um, Amazon has its reason for doing what it's doing, uh, but we, we cannot discountenance the impact that both Amazon, Netflix, uh, and um, to some extent, even Showmax have had on growth in the industry because they've made it possible for, um, you know, certain kind of projects to be contemplated that otherwise would not have been. Um, yes. and, and so they, there is a lot of merit in the fact that they 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 they, they play you know in in the industry sadly um 
their exit uh, from, um, they are going to continue to do acquisitions. And that's what they have put out there. So, but their exit from doing originals is where yes. the impact is. And it is in those originals that filmmakers are able to be ambitious, you know. Um, and this has impacted people, different kinds, different filmmakers and different production companies. And we have also been impacted because we had in development a limited series that was just about to be greenlit. And that's, you know, not anymore. And the scale of, 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 of the production that would have happened, you know, because they were supporting that, that, that production can't be replicated unless we find another, um, you know, uh, platform to support that. So to the extent that our ambitions and what we do are dependent on that, um, you know, there is cause for concern. And therefore, what is our, come back to that. How do we, how do we make sure that we're not in this position again? I, I would say two ways. Um, number one is, is not to, not to scale our ambition down. It is to keep our ambitions up and even going higher. Um, but I would still then say back to the money conversation that we need an exhibition network that makes it possible for us to recoup funding in the film up to the extent of two, three million dollars. Right? Yeah. Because yeah. India as a film industry will not be feeling the exit the way Nollywood is feeling it. Right. Because Indian filmmakers have a plethora of theaters and recoup a lot of money so that when you have that possibility, then even in your negotiations with the platforms, you know, your voice is stronger, your demands are higher because you are not dependent on them to recoup investment, right? right. But when you made a film and you have investors on your back, you know, when are we going to get our money? How are we going to have money? Da, 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 da. You're having that conversation in your ears and time is going. When you, when you then sit before a platform, you know, owner to have a conversation as to what you want yeah. for this film. For most filmmakers, what the conversation in their head is, this thing they're offering me pays off all the people on my back right. and allows me peace of mind. So you're not negotiating based on the true value of what you have brought to the table, but you're negotiating on the basis of what your need is at the moment. Yes. And we have to be able to take that away, right? And the only way we can take that away is to create platforms that allow for revenue streams, you know, exploitation that puts you in a strong position to negotiate, you know, down the line so that the platform or the streamers are part of the revenue streams available to you, but they are not the only revenue stream available to you. I think that that's where we need to get our industry to. And if we're able to achieve that, then, you know, just the sky's the limit. I fully agree with you there, because if you look at how our industry has even reached the level that it has, it began with people looking inwards, coming back, you know, focusing on what resources we have and playing with that. I mean, yes, we don't have reached the sky with all of that, but at least that is a firm basis. So truly what you say about us looking inwards and finding the resources we being that I think will be the way will be the way forward. Mm. Now let's go back a moment to the first features project in line with all of the thing of funding and recouping one's expenditure that we've been talking about. One of the targets of the first features projects was to elevate Nigerian cinema to global prominence. With the themes that have been released so far, can you assess your attainment of that goal, especially in terms of the success of recouping all the costs that you have put into this? So the the objective of achieving that with the first features project is not a is not a one time objective. So let me just put that out there, which is that the ambition is that 
these filmmakers would make this set of films and then go on to make on an incremental basis films that up the game, both their game yes. and the industry's game. Um, right. I, I would gladly wager these films against most of the films that established filmmakers are making in industry very, right now. And I would say they would stand heads above shoulders in this, at the current, you know, setting. So that's, that's for me already, that's, that's, that's an achievement. And then the films are also being very well received, you know, um, on the platforms. Um, Love and Live and Cake have gone out and both have been number one on, on the Amazon platform and both I think are still on the, on the top 10 um, okay. um, at the moment. So again, um, that's, that's, um, that's, 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 that's the, um, what do you call it? The, 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 the taste of what, whatever is in the pudding, right? So that's yeah, people. The taste, you know, of the... <laughs> the taste of the pudding is in the eating. Taste of the pudding is in the eating. Exactly. <laughs> you know, so that's 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 direct feedback we're getting from that. So so that's that's great, but I'm 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 super excited at the fact that I I I go on set. I've gone now uh, five times with five different directors, and and I see, and I see how they come into their own. How how they they take charge. Of the project, how how they express themselves, and I'm I'm really 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 confident that this class of filmmakers are going to be the future stars of Nollywood and of African filmmaking. Not not not, not restricting them just to Nollywood at all. Uh, that we're going to see films from these filmmakers both now and in the future, you know, dictate the direction that the industry is going into because they're very aware filmmakers and they're very confident filmmakers and they are very knowledgeable filmmakers in the craft of directing. When you were describing the process earlier, mm. you mentioned that these upcoming directors, you place them or you give them access to expert colorists, editors, and so on, who also provided that. Now, this, this you, you are focusing on directors, and I think generally people tend to focus a lot on some of these more prominent positions, but what is happening with ensuring that we have good colorists, more of them coming up, we have more editors coming up, people in these, you could say largely overlooked roles, but which are so essential. How, is, how do you see that happening in the industry? Because if these ones who are doing so well now retire tomorrow, for instance, do we have enough people coming up behind who are learning the craft also from these experts in the field? Hmm. So first for me, why directors, right? Why directors? Because I'm a director and you can only give what you have, right? So, so for me, if <clears throat> I could replicate directors who understand who are first and foremost passionate about the art of filmmaking, understand the art of directing, have unique voices, and have things they want to say, um, then, you know, I, I, I would have succeeded in, in passing it on. So for me, that's, that's, that's part of what's key. So that's why it's directors I'm focusing on. But that right. actually the director very directly impacts the performance of the rest of the team. So for example, when I sit to have a conversation with a production designer, if you were not prepared, you're not come back to the next meeting as unprepared. So it challenges you to want to do better. And I believe that a director that knows his audience is clear in his vision, challenges the rest, the rest of the team to rise to a level of performance that they perhaps are not right. performing at. So that has a very direct impact on the rest of the craft, right? All right. the way down to actors. Mm -hmm. Because when actors meet a prepared director, they sit up. Yes. 
they prepare better. So there's a direct impact where that's concerned. But you're absolutely right. The other crafts do need, you know, the same kind of injection of, of training, support, time and effort. Um, it's editors, it's colorists, it's sound people, it's, um, it's, it's production designers, it's costume um, designers, it's first ADs, first ACs, mm. um, it's, it's the whole gamut, right? And, and I think that, um, and a lot of, of those kinds of training is more by doing than by being told. Yes. You know, so I think that um, like you would have in the London Film School, like you would have in the um, London Film and Television School, like you would have in, in um, different schools around the world, right? That the training institutions are the places where the people receiving training get to have, you know, direct practical time on facilities that mostly would not even have access to again when they graduate, right? Yes. So you have the best yes. of cameras, the best of editing facilities, the best of sound stages, the best of whatever, whatever, provided by these training institutions. So therefore, uh, the, 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 um, the, 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 the NFI in JAWS, your school, any other institution that is, you know, established and seeks to provide that kind of training should have the ambition of providing those kind of facilities, right? And pooling mm -hmm. industry practitioners to become faculty in yes. these places so that direct access is provided to both um, equipment and intellect and practice. Because a colorist can, you can tell them everything about the science of color and da 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 da, but if they do not actually sit in front of a coloring yes. system, yes. to do the work, you're just talking. And Yes. And, and, and even though technology has democratized the production space, it is also sometimes the Achilles heel of an industry such as ours. Because a lot of people can do a lot of things on the computer, right? The bulk mm. of the coloring houses that I've gone to in Nigeria have not done the requisite investment in hardware. Right. So that's still a problem. Right. So when we provide funding support for, for the industry, support to acquire those hardwares and get even a bit more training for the colorists and a bit more exposure to them to be able to work those systems that we are, we're making possible for them to get is part of also how, how we, can, we, can, we, can, we can get that going. And I think that the ability to, to have people on the study to intern uh, with spaces and production houses and productions, both locally and internationally, you know, would also help in, in, in this direction. That's a very good point. Thank you. Well, Inkim has given us some very useful data here, and she is, she is agreeing with what you said earlier about the platforms and says multiple platforms to recoup, including cinemas in every local government, as you earlier mentioned. In the UK, currently, there are 843 cinemas for a population of 66.5 million, or one cinema for every 79,000 people. Mm. The most recent yearbook on cinemas in Nigeria reveals that there are currently only 68 cinemas in the country of 36 states, plus one federal capital territory, Abuja, for a population of over 211 million people, or one cinema for every 3.1 million people. It's in the numbers, she says, and yeah. actually, it takes it takes on a different twist when you then look at where the cinemas are situated. A good portion of them are located just in Lagos alone, so there are many <laughs> areas, towns, and uh, so on that do not even have a fortune in cinema. So certainly, that's that is important infrastructure and, that and we need I, to get. I, I would I would also even uh, sorry. I would also even wager that one, whilst we tend to push everything to government, 
that I would also say that the the cinemas, the cinema owners themselves, the current crop of cinema owners themselves, haven't done much by way of audience development, because I think that it is it is it is actually still quite a shame that no Nigerian film has been seen in the theaters by five hundred thousand people. Lagos, with a population of over twenty million people, should very easily have five hundred thousand people watch a film in Lagos. So as much as we position that it is it is the absence of the of the cinemas themselves, but even the cinemas that we have right now are performing below par. And that's because the owners of those cinemas are not engaging in audience development. And that if we paid more attention to that, if, like most things in Nigeria, we just rent seeking, right? Yes, I've created a cinema. Whoever comes in, comes in. If they don't come in, well, people are not coming. But there's a lot more to that, right? Cine World in the UK is still actively recruiting and pulling, trying to get people to come to the cinema, right? Uh, the, 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 the biggest chain in the, in the US is still pushing to get more people to come to the cinema. So you can't just build a cinema and if people come, they come. If they don't, they don't. I think that part of the challenge is to get the current owners of cinemas to invest more in audience development, to do more to support the films that they put in their theaters. When you say audience development, what kinds of things are you thinking about? Um, when I say audience development, I'm thinking about increased advertising to create awareness yeah. um, of content that is in the cinemas. It is specialized discount schemes. It is loyalty right. programs. It is active taking of the cinema to the people. So, for example, there are, so if you believe that your audience grows to become your audience, right? Then there are categories of people that you should help in introducing to cinema. Right. So right. there are students that if you gave them student discounts would come to the cinema but otherwise won't be able to go, particularly now when a ticket is about 7,000 something. Exactly. That rules yes. out that group of people. But you have a, you have a 250 seater cinema, right? Where you're showing a film and 60% of the time, it's at, it's at 30%, 40% capacity. So you have a lot of mm -hmm. inventory that is not being sold. How do you use that inventory? to pull people who otherwise would not come to the cinema to come. And if you pull them in and they fall in love with it, they would then find other ways to then come, come again subsequently. Yes. Right? So it's about even going down to primary schools, right? In, because it's a culture. And you might not have a, a theater in the, in, the, in the poor neighborhoods now, but you're going to get to a point where you will have it, a different kind of theater. So why don't you go to um, Mushin, for example, and you get school children that, that are there and bring them to the cinema. Let them just experience the cinema. You don't crave what you don't know, right? So the yes. more we can get people to experience and just see it there in their mind, and they're like, oh, I'd like to have that again next time when I have money. And if someday a cinema crops up next to them, they would go. Okay. If someday yes. they are out of Mushing and they're where there's a cinema, they would go. But you have to actively try and create that mindset. You have to encourage that culture. That's what's not being done. And I think that's what needs to be done. That's a beautiful idea, really, because in a way, well, not in a way, that's what it is. It's investment. You, must, yeah. you need to spend in order to get later on down the line. But it, it's a truly, I mean, I see clearly now you've said it. It's something that truly does need to be done and has not been done. I fully agree with you. Yeah. Yeah. And because the, the cost 
many people already write it off completely. I'm not going in that direction. I don't have that kind of money, and that's <laughs> it. It's a close. It's a close deal. It's a, mm. uh, okay. Now you have linked your concern for providing guidance to upcoming filmmakers to your own experience as a young filmmaker. What were the specific challenges that you faced and did you resolve them? Because there was nobody doing the kind of handholding for you that you're doing for others now. So how did you resolve those kinds of problems? So I, I, I think I think most most of the time, um, the degree of hunger, not yeah. hunger for food, hunger for yes. achieving what you want to achieve, uh, propels you to do very just just about anything, right? That is that pushes you forward towards achieving that. So first was seeking out training, um, and and how we get we got to making. Um, 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 Keeping Faith, my first film, was simply um, Femi Kayode, Femi Odubemi, and myself um, would sit, um, I remember very well in Femi's office in Suruleri, uh, when he was with um, SDB McCann, um, in his production company, their, their production company then, um, and, and we would sit there and we would yak and yak about what 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 Nollywood was doing that wasn't right, or that film is rubbish, or that one was that, or that one was that. And then one day we just say to ourselves, well, listen, if 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 that's all we're gonna keep doing, we either go out there and make a film or just shut up. <laughs> that's how the idea of the story of, of the project Keeping Faith came to be. And I came up with the story. Femi Kayode wrote the script, and Femi Odugemi and myself produced it, and I directed. Um, and, and it was produced along with Ego Boyo um, um, of Temple Productions at the time. That's how Keeping Faith came to be. Just put your money, put your wherever where your mouth is, or just shut up, right? And 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 so for me. It was the absence of anybody giving you the opportunity to do it. And so if you wanted to do it, then you have to do it yourself. So that led to keeping faith. But also it's like, OK, I'm going to do keeping faith. But I also want to find out because at, at that time I was running an advertising agency and I was, I was making good money. So I could just continue doing that. But that was a stopgap thing because I, I really just wanted to make films. So part of the thing was, OK, in making keeping faith, I was asking myself two key questions. Was it something I enjoyed doing and would like to continue doing? And two, was it something I believed that I had capacity for? Right? Remember that at this point, I had done NTA TV college and I had done um, theater arts yes. and worked in TV and radio briefly before starting the advertising agency. That's my experience up to this point. And first question tick, I enjoyed. It was, I was the happiest I had ever been being on set. And number two, yes, for that industry, for that time, I had capacity. And if, if that was where I wanted to play, I could very easily, um, you know, sit there create a title for myself or an alias for myself as was wants to happen at that point in time and and probably would have made a gazillion films by now but my capacity at that point in time did not match my aspirations because i wanted to be able to make films that would be consumed globally films that yeah. you didn't need to make an excuse for as a pre you didn't need to have a prefix before you watch it. You just watch it like you'd watch any other film and judge it like you would judge any other film Amen. that you would see anywhere in the world. That's the benchmark I wanted. And I realized that for that benchmark, I couldn't do it with my level at that time. So that informed going to the London Film School, you know. Uh, and then after that, 
everything else has happened. But now there are opportunities a lot more than existed then. Um, you have you have different people doing different things to support and give people a leg up. So I yeah. think that where we are at now and what's happening now, um, and even in terms of technology and and liberalization of this space, um, you are it is a lot easier to get into the industry than it was when I got into the industry. Yes. Yes. Well, just a reminder to our audience, we still have time to take some of your questions, please. So feel free to drop your questions in the chat box and we'll take them. Just drop your questions and we'll take them from the chat box. I read the harrowing tale that you told, one of your essays about what it cost you to make a place in the stars. This is now about funding. Really, I say it was a harrowing tale, I must confess. Now, so how, can you share with us some of that story? And how does your process of obtaining funds today compare with those early attempts? Because I, I imagine that with what you're doing now, especially for the, the, the bringing up some of these upcoming directors, that must cost you quite a bit in terms of funding. So how are you managing now with getting that funding? And yes, what is the what is the landscape like really in that regard today? At the time, at the time I made a place in the stars, there was no avenue for getting funds. So the bulk of it was my funds, it was personal funds. And, and friends and family funds, if you like. That was the only way to fund anything at that point in time. Um, but I'd be remiss not to acknowledge the fact that um, Emekan Bar at, um, at the uh, Video Census Board yeah. was also, you know, in instrumental to supporting a lot of films and filmmakers at that point in time. Yeah. And, and we did get some, some grant support from, from the Census Board. Okay. Uh, through yeah. Emekamba. Um, we got some support for the project as well from um, the, the Nigerian Film Corporation uh, by way okay. of um, equipment that they supported the project with. So they gave us their lenses uh, at some point. Um, so we got support from, from those. Um, it was at that point that I had met Dr. Lakuri. So even though we hadn't started being production partners at the time, um, he also did some support. Um, uh, because of the different life circles of that project, you know, um, support came from different people at different points in time for different kinds of things. Um, you know, so, so, so there's that, but, but primarily that funding was funding, um, uh, that was coming from monies that I'd made, um, coming from making Namibia. Uh, the 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 struggle for liberation um, at the time, um, yeah. So so that's that's that. Um, but today, it is a lot easier to have funding conversations. So, for example, the the first features project, we funded the realization of the first three films okay. on the project as a proof of concept. So we funded the entire training, the entire development process, and the production of the first three films. And then we now took on investors to support the production of subsequent films. Uh, and, and the funding from those investors and a bridging finance that became possible to have that kind of conversation because of yeah. the avenues that the film could go to uh, is how the, 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 the entire first feature scheme is now being funded. You know, so we've gotten to the point where in the industry at the moment, you can have funding conversations. There are funding okay. bodies and organizations that are actually actively looking and actively supporting the industry. Um, we are working with NBO Finance and NBO Finance 
is providing us bridging finance, you know, to the in excess of five hundred thousand dollars, right? Wow. As as part of what we're doing, you know, on 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 the project, um, and then we have other funding bodies that we have which provide what else, the other funding that we need in terms of um, bridging finance uh, to finish executing, you know, the slate of films. But that's not a conversation right. you could have had five years ago, right? And those conversations were being made possible by the presence of Amazon, the presence of Netflix, the presence of, of um, Showmax, right? Now, when, when the, and we have to understand that the, the change, the pivot that Amazon has made is not new to Amazon, or is not exclusive to Amazon, that Netflix had actually made that pivot right. a while back as well, which is to say we would acquire, we would co-produce, but we would not fund originals okay. anymore, or we would scale down on the production of originals. Now, if you, if, if like me, you read what's happening and follow the trends in the global industry, you would find that that's not something they're doing only here, right? Yeah. That it is what most streamers are pivoting towards now. Um, Netflix is going from spending, you know, billions in, um, what do you call it, um, originals production they're scaling that down by a huge percentage and focusing more on third party acquisitions. It's the same thing that Hulu is doing. It's the same thing that Apple TV is doing. It's the same thing that um, Disney Plus is doing. So it's the trend. Sooner or later, it was going to come anyway. But I yeah. feel that they were doing this in the industry it made it possible for you to be able to do a, a balance sheet, right? That justified an income, an expenditure that could be written off by an income. And because you could have that conversation, finance people were able to look at you and say, okay, you know what? Okay, we would give you this amount of money because you could cash flow it in a way that made sense to them. That's what these people being here have made possible. But as they withdraw that, that conversation is watered down. We need to put infrastructure in place that continues to support that conversation. Because it's only when right. that funding is available that you can do projects. Right, right. Obviously, the, the investor wants to see how or what platforms you're going to use to get the money back. So yep. clearly that aspect of structure is key. Now you have mentioned the investment companies and so on. What is the experience with the banks? Because we've had the banks in on this conversation for quite a while, but yet it still seems to me that they still have a challenge with the industry in terms of really finding a way to getting i suppose it's not also understanding the the business as it were but i do not see i may be wrong but i do not see that the level of involvement i know that they have had their fingers bent in the past okay but currently now people talk more about investment companies rather than the banks themselves is that i don't know am i wrong in this that the banks really are not as involved as perhaps they could be the banks pay lip service to what they want to do. They're snooping around the industry, but they have not devoted enough time to study and understand the industry. Yes. Right? Um, yes. They, they want the industry to fit into their model rather right. than understanding the industry enough to create a model for the industry. Yes. And until they do that, they would continue to be outsiders looking in. And, 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 and what, what the, 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 the finance houses have done is taking the time to engage specific players in the industry uh, and, 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 and work with them 
to see how best to make safe lending right to the industry and i think that uh the the, the current crop of um productions and production companies that they are supporting you know are further encouraging them in the in the in in how the the debt portfolio is being managed the the returns that they're seeing based on the investment that they're making and and remember that we have finance houses that are giving loans but we also have people that are able to pull huge investments just as direct investments equity investments right, right. as well so that's that's also right. another way to look at it and I, I think that we would see growth in both of this and maybe even a change of approach in the banks when on a wider scale, um, the industry can provide platforms, avenues through which recruitment can happen. And you can you can see those on paper and, and you can see that in practice as well. Right, I fully agree with you there. Well, I have uh, another uh, a question in the chat box from Ngendelin. The trend is scaling back, she says, you have mentioned. The trend is scaling back, you have mentioned. Does it have anything to do with piracy in the industry? I won't say that piracy has, has since, so let me skip, let me roll that back. Since since half of a yellow sun, I wouldn't say that piracy has directly impacted the capacity of any film to recoup okay. investments. It has been a challenge, but it has not directly impacted the ability of any film to recoup investments. Okay. And I think that they have been more stringent um, management of content. Um, since then as well. Uh, I think that the, the bulk of leakage we have for content is when they go to um, when they go to the streamers. Um, okay. For a long time until recently with um, a tribe called Judah and um, the other one, um, I forget the name, um, there hasn't been a direct leakage from the cinemas, um, which is the case with these two films. Um, and I'm sure that that in itself would, would, would call for a lot more scrutiny on the part of CN, which is the Association of um, Cinema Owners, uh, and right. that perhaps whatever happened there would be investigated and mitigated against. Um, um, but other than that, I won't say directly piracy has impacted any film to the point where um, it's a major issue. It continues to be a concern and a challenge, though. Great, thank you. But linking it to what you said earlier, we also have to look in well to find creative ways to tackle that as a yep. challenge. I mean, Absolutely. it has helped us to grow, really, if we if we have yep. to face the facts. It did yep. help us to grow at the beginning. And OK, how to work with that. Right, thank you so much, Steve. We're coming to the end of this. Let me just ask you for some last words here. What advice would you give to young upcoming filmmakers, especially those ones that will not be able to tap into this great opportunity you are given to this group or those that you work with? So for the fellow out there or the fella out there trying to get into this industry, create a name and really get going, what kind of advice would you give to this person in terms of setting up structures? So I would say, um, if you're desirous of coming into the industry, um, first declare what you want to be in the industry, uh, because most people try to be everything. Right. And, you know, a jack of all trades, as they say, is usually a master of none. Master of none. Pick a lane stay in that lane get as much training as you can in that lane and hone your craft as much as you can in that lane so if you're a director oh, and then create partnerships as well 
you know, that would help you. So if you're a director, find an editor that is aspiring like you, right? These days you can shoot even with your film, with your phone. With your phone, yes. So practice, practice, practice. Think, shoot, think, shoot. And as you are shooting, you're providing the editor with the opportunity to practice. Because he's editing as well. Yeah. And, and, and find kindred spirits. Create a tribe of your own. And practice with all of them. Just keep honing your craft. Um, I find that a lot of people come into different things as, a, as part of wanting to become directors. And, and I have a problem with wannabe directors. If you're in the directing lane, be in the directing lane, right? Don't say you want to be director, editor, composer. Yes, you might be able to do all of those, but it waters down your focus, right? Right, And don't be a, co a costume designer that wants to be an, a director. If you are a costume designer, focus on it. Hone your craft in that aspect and become the best you can be in that. And because as you become better at it, you, the demand for your, your talent and your gift would become even more and you would find more collaborators and you find more projects to work on, right? And you can go on to become, you know, the best at what you do. And you would find opportunity to work in projects, you know, but nobody wants to work with you now. And the next time they come around and say, oh, no, I'm no longer doing costume. I'm, 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 I'm trying to be a director, right? Because people also like to grow along with people. Yes. And I, I won't be confident in collaborating with you if, if I know that somehow your trajectory would shift in a way that leaves a void in my own team of collaborators. So right. first, be very clear what you want to be. Get as much training as you can in that space. And there's this, in fairness, a lot of free training that you can get you know, in different, yeah. different organizations, different opportunities. But then there is also the University of YouTube where everything yes. you want is also there. And if you blend all of those, you can acquire whatever knowledge you want to acquire. And then do, 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 practice, practice, practice. You know, um, find a mentor, someone that you can shadow, someone that you can reach out to just to ask questions, you know, just to seek direction and guidance and support. Uh, and I think that's that's really what I, I wish I had when I was starting. And, and um, what I'm happily, I, I believe, providing um, for a lot of young filmmakers uh, in my journey to fully earning the title of Uncle Steve. <laughs> Great. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Well, I would yeah. add, I would add to that what someone else, what others also have said, which is be visible. That yeah. given this university of YouTube that you mentioned, well, people also have to be visible so that they can actually attract some of that collaboration. That, that's, that is and key. So Absolutely. I, that is key. Yes. Yes. Well, thank you so much, Steve. This has been lovely. I've enjoyed this conversation tremendously. Thank you for sharing for sharing so much with us. And uh, certainly you have challenged us as an educational institution to reach out and get facilitators, which is something we usually do. But I think you have set a trap for yourself because we're going to be reaching out for you now to, <laughs> <laughs> to bring you into that into that mix as well. well no. where, I, where I can, where I can, I'll be happy to. And, and thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Thank you. We enjoyed this so much. Thank you. And thank you all very much for being with us to our guests. Thank you for your questions. Thank you for your attention as well. And we look forward to having you at our next session. Thank you once again, Steve. Yeah, and thank do, you. Do enjoy bye. the rest of the day. Okay. Bye-bye. Okay. <laughs>